all inside PCL reconstruction, keynotes for better result. A 17-year-old male patient with a history of an accident three months ago. Physical examination of the left knee reveals a positive posterior drawer test. Virus and dial tests are negative. The quadriceps active test appears positive in this patient. The patient is diagnosed with an isolated PCL injury in the left knee. In this surgery, the graft was taken from the superficial quadriceps, specifically the rectus femoris tendon. The superficial quadriceps has proven to be reliable, providing a large and long graft with minimal patient complaints. Identify the superior pole of the patella and make a vertical incision two centimeters above it. Identify the quadriceps tendon. Identify the separation between the superficial and deep layers at this point, where a layer of fat tissue will be visible. Cut through this layer, ensuring that the two centimeters of quadriceps tendon above the superior pole of the patella remains intact. Suture the tendon, then perform tendon stripping. A quadruplet graft with an expected length of 85 mm was created from this obtained quadriceps graft. The diameter of the femoral portion of this graft is 9 mm, while the diameter of the tibial portion is 9.5 mm. The design for graft implantation involves embedding the graft 15 mm into the femoral tunnel with an intra-articular length of 40 mm. 30 mm expected into the tibial tunnel. Adjustable buttons were attached to both ends of the graft with additional augmentation using internal brace tape passed through the femoral button. Standard anterolateral and anteromedial portals were created. The remnant PCL is visible. Buckling of the ACL is also observed, which returns to tension with an anterior drawer test, indicating a PCL rupture. In this PCL reconstruction, an intercruciate approach will be used to access the transeptal technique. Therefore, the anterolateral and anteromedial portals will be created as close as possible to the patellar tendon. After evaluating other intraarticular structures and clearing the excessive fat pad, RF was used to access the roof of the notch between the ACL and PCL or we called it 12 o'clock access. The shaver was then used to clean the intercruciate septum, followed by accessing the posterior medial and posterior lateral windows. The appearance of these two posterior compartment windows is referred to as TU bat eyes. The camera was then directed towards the posterior medial space to create the posterior medial portal. Transillumination technique could visualize the superficial medial structures, primarily the saphenous vein, ensuring that the portal created avoids these structures. After creating the posterior medial portal, a blunt rod was inserted and passed through the posterior septum just behind the remnant PCL, traversing the posterior lateral window into the posterior lateral space directly behind the lateral meniscus. This rod could be visualized directly. The rod is protruded towards the lateral side. This posterior lateral portal should ideally be positioned between the LCL and the lateral biceps head. Ensure that the posterior lateral portal does not extend posteriorly as the peroneal nerve lies behind the biceps. The trocar sheath is then repeatedly passed in and out from the lateral side to clear the pathway and partially free the septum. This method is very safe. Next, the septum is cleaned using a shaver and RF with an up and down motion in the same plane, without directing posteriorly. In this view, we can also identify the popliteus tendon. Once the septum is cleaned, the identification of the footprint begins, starting from the remnant and moving distally. Two landmarks are identified, the champagne glass drop-off and the popliteus muscle.
The next step is to identify the superior portion of the popliteus muscle. The ideal tibial footprint is located at this point, just above the popliteus muscle, ensuring that our PCL reconstruction has a hooking effect on the tibia to prevent posterior translation. The PCL tibial guide is then inserted through the posteromedial portal. A stopper is used during the insertion of the K-wire to prevent it from advancing too far posteriorly. Additional insertion can be performed using hand drilling or a mallet for greater precision. To facilitate the retroremer, a pre-drilling with a 4.5 cm bit is done. The retroremer we use has a diameter of 4.9 mm. The retroremer is expanded at the mouth of the tunnel to measure the length of the tibial tunnel. Our tibial tunnel measures 58 mm. We desire a tibial graft depth of 30 mm, but we add 5 mm for tensioning, resulting in a drilling depth of 35 mm. This leaves a bone bridge of 28 mm, which is excellent, particularly for securing the button. A single limb passing suture is then passed through. The viewing camera is moved to the anterolateral portal. The PCL footprint is identified and a marking is made at the central point of the remnant and as close to the cartilage as possible to mark the femoral tunnel. The viewing camera was moved to the anteromedial portal. The femoral tunnel was then created by inserting a K-wire, followed by sequential drilling. The desired depth for the femoral tunnel is 15 mm. The passing suture is then passed through. The viewing camera was returned to the anterolateral portal. Next, the passing suture for the tibial tunnel is identified through the previously created intercruciate space, ensuring that our graft will be positioned above the remnant PCL rather than below it. Both single limb passing sutures are then combined and brought out through the anteromedial portal. We will pass the graft using the transportal technique. We recommend using a single limb passing suture as start because using a double limb can sometimes cause the loops to cross each other, making it difficult to pass the graft. We start by passing the graft towards the tibia first. The double limb passing suture is passed through followed by the passing suture and button from the graft. We use the roll and pulley technique, which we find to be the most suitable and easiest method to pull the graft towards the tibia without damaging it. Next, the graft is passed into the femoral tunnel. We perform direct visualization of the button exiting the femoral cortex and then flip it. This direct visualization helps prevent the button from being pulled out too far into the soft tissue if pulled too hard. The adjustable suture on the femoral side is then pulled to draw the graft in. Change the viewing again to anteromedial. Before the entire tunnel is filled, the wire guiding the interference screw is inserted. We add a screw to the femoral side of our PCL reconstruction because this is the weakest point of the graft. At this point, there is acute angle tension from the straight femoral tunnel as the graft bends posteriorly. Pre-tensioning is performed. The ideal placement for the screw is on the postero superior side of the tunnel. This screw position is intended to push the graft anteriorly. We will use a screw size of 6 or 7 mm with tapering before bio screw insertion. The viewing camera can be moved back to the posterior to visualize the graft. Next, the graft is tightened towards the tibial tunnel. We use a button extension as a precaution. The graft is tightened in a 90 degree flexion position with anterior drawer. The securing suture knotting was performed. The PCL graft is visible along with the preserved remnant PCL. The tension of the ACL, which was previously buckling, also appears to have returned.
The tourniquet is then deflated while intra-articular bleeding is controlled. After that, a gentle massage is performed to expel any remaining fluid. This is done to reduce effusion, thereby minimizing postoperative pain and enabling quicker mobilization for the patient. Post-reconstruction hemarthrosis is also believed to cause arthrogenic muscle inhibition. The day after surgery, the patient exhibits good leg extension strength.